and as you say, it was really a sort of transformative in your view of uh, military affairs and, and world affairs, if you will. Um, you get you get uh, to about 2008, 2009. W- what are you thinking about what you're going to do next? So I, I did three deployments to Afghanistan, and I saw kind of the futility in the fight that we were we were having there. And then the Ranger Regiment, we went to Iraq. So I went to Iraq in 2005 and I saw the same thing that I saw in Afghanistan, but amplified in Iraq uh, in which, you know, we weren't dealing with fighters from just Pakistan. We were dealing with fighters from Syria, from Iran, from all these different areas who were traveling all over the world to fight us where where they could fight us or where they could just hop in a car and come do it. Right. And the reality of, as long as women are giving birth to, to young boys over there and we're over there in a uniform capacity, this conflict is going to be ongoing. It's going to be endless. And as much weight as I swung during that time, because the Ranger Regiment, we did have just about every asset under the sun to win this war. And we were, you know, our, our term in the special operations is mowing the grass. Right. We're just going to cut the insurgents down that are there. And then six, seven months later, they're just going to grow right back. Sure. Yep. Um, and, you know, I saw this as a 27 year old lieutenant or a captain at that point in the Rangers. And there was the general sentiment around that. And we all started seeing this as I mean, this is our you know, fourth, fifth year of the war. And the, that mindset was ongoing. And so I decided that uh, it was time for me to get out. Uh, I transitioned to civilian life, which is tough. It just is. And you hear that sentiment by a lot of veterans, and and it's the truth. It's just hard on everybody. And I I just went to work in the civilian market, just trying to get back to life. Uh, I lost my job in the housing crash as a home builder in 2008. I ended up getting hired to work for a company called Remote Medical International, in which we were contracting doctors and clinics and pharmacies to contractors working overseas. So I started traveling back overseas and I saw that small businesses were making the most positive impact in these war-torn communities. And I saw this in Africa. I saw it through Southeast Asia. I saw everywhere that I went and my mindset was, is, well, how do we bring more small business to these communities to, to bolster that initiative? It seems more sustainable and ethical than continuing to send surges of young men and women over there to cut more grass. And I, one day I just walked into a combat boot factory, uh, at the invite of a friend who had built the factory. And I, I saw what I wanted to do with the rest of my life was to, you know, help people, um, make products. So something that they could sell to earn a living to, so that way their kids could go to school and eventually it would do well. And the long story is I, in this combat boot factory, uh, I saw a flip-flop thong punch through a combat boot sole. It was kind of a prototype joke product that was built. And I just thought it was, you know, the a combat flip-flops. So the juxtaposition of the two words was really interesting. You know, I used to think that being an Army Ranger and yanking terrorists, you know, out of their homes in the middle of the night was the best way to serve my country. But now I believe that creating jobs and economy and education in these areas is the best way to serve my country. And this was, but this I, was sort of accidental while, while you were, while you were realizing the value of small businesses and, and the security that that brought to some of these war torn villages and locations, almost accidentally do you, the business idea of combat flip-flops the only way that I could describe it, and it really depends on what your beliefs are, was by <laughs> divine force. Like the universe kept showing me the same thing in every place that I went was that small business owners and people that were making things were generally cooler people than people that were shooting each other. So what do we do to, to create more of that? And yeah, it was, it just, it just happened. And, uh, I ended up calling a ranger buddy of mine, Donald Lee. And I said, hey, man, would you be willing to, to get on this weird project to make flip-flops in a combat boot factory in Afghanistan? And he said yes. And then my brother came along as our de- uh, designer. Uh, his name's Andy. And then we just started this crazy idea of starting a flip-flop company in a combat boot factory in Afghanistan. And it's since blown up to a multi-million dollar business working all over the world. Um, and then we use our, our profits to, or we had used our profits to put little girls to school in Afghanistan. And as of June of 2021, when I did the Q2 numbers, we 
gotten our first comma. We put over a thousand girls in school for a year in Afghanistan. I want to come back to that piece because the charity is such a big part of this in in Afghanistan. The impact it was was going to have was going to be such a big thing. But what in the world made you and a, a another ranger buddy think you somehow can cobble together a business uh, and 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 make a buck and make this work? I mean, what you know. What pixie dust did you have that some other guy didn't, or were you just too stubborn to know you couldn't do it? I think we were the only guys dumb enough to try it, to be honest. (laughs) I didn't want to use that word. I said stubborn. (laughs) Yeah, it's, I mean, it's when you come up with a crazy idea, you know, people say, oh, there's no way that'll work. And then there's no way that'll work. There's no way that'll work. It's a good idea, but there's no way it'll work. Well, you know, we used to jump out of airplanes and put 500 guys on an airfield in the middle of the night in under five minutes and do some very complicated stuff just because you can't do it doesn't mean that we can't do it. And that's just our mindset is like the real products solve real problems. And if you want to charge a premium for your product, you solve a complicated problem and then charge a premium for it. And so this was a real problem that needed to get solved. And so we came out with a high end line of footwear that you know, we charge a premium for, but it's a quality product. And we started making something that not only looks good and lasts a long time, but it's got a really cool story and message behind it, which which our customers are proud to promote. Listen to this full episode and more on the Apple Podcasts app, Blog Talk Radio, Google Podcasts, or iHeartRadio. And now streaming on Amazon Music, Audible, and Spotify.